there's one more piece to the puzzle uh, to get us where we've been trying to get all quarter now. Um, we've been trying to fundamentally write F equals MA for a complex, complex multi-body system. And <clears throat> so far, uh, last time, right, I talked about these generalized active forces, FR. And if we think about sort of the simplest definition here, sum of the, all, all the forces on a particle times <coughs> has to equal its mass times acceleration. This generalized active force is, is synonymous to the sum of the forces on, on that system. So if I had just a single particle, single acceleration, calculated FR, I, I get the sum of the forces. And this part, we have not calculated yet. And that's the last piece of the puzzle. And we're going to introduce a term called FR star that's going to give us that. In Keynes' equations, Sorry, it's going to be a negative. Looks like this. <clears throat> These are second order ordinary differential equations that describe not, not ordinary, second order differential equations that describe the uh, dynamics of the system. And um, we talked about last time that we could, for a non-holonomic system, we would get this. And there's an equivalent, FR star tilde. Holonomic, non-holonomic. So there are a couple things that I want to revisit, and then we'll talk about how um, we've got one more thing to say about FR, and um, and then we'll and then we'll do FR star, and in the second half of the class today, I'm going to pick a non-trivial example, and we're going to calculate FR and FR star for it. Okay, and once you know how to do that. Um, if your project is a holonomic system, you're good to go. You, you've learned everything here to figure out the equations of motion for uh, your project or any other holonomic system. Um, and, and, and if it's not holonomic, yeah, we've we got all the pieces. Um, <clears throat> the, the lectures after this, we're going to touch on um, how to simulate these systems, how to visualize them. And, and also some other details about um, uh, things that you might want to do. We're gonna, um, I'm going to have a lecture or two on um, introduction to optimal control for these kind of systems. Show you, give you a little idea of how that works. And we'll also, um, depending on maybe your, uh, maybe I'll take a get a vote for your interest, but um, topics like collision. Um, uh, we could also talk about relationship of these equations to other formulations of um, equations of motion. Um, we could talk more about the uh, numerical um, realizations of these and, and uh, integration. There's a number of topics, so maybe next time I'll we'll introduce simulation, but I'll talk about, uh, we'll try to get a vote of maybe what people might want to go over. Okay, so... I goofed up twice trying to explain this uh, equivalence thing. And I just want to, it's important for the thing I have to say next. And I just want to get it right, finally. I apologize for that. All right, say we have some rigid body 
that has all these forces applied to it at different points. Okay? <clears throat> There's a set of, these are all bounded vectors, right? Because they have a line of action. And the set of these includes um, from i equals 1 to 4 in this case. We have this set of vectors. So you can replace this set of bounded vectors with two things. A torque of a couple, which has no resultant. And that torque, I said uh, when we introduced it, has the same value no matter what point we choose on the rigid body. And a vector. So this is the equivalence. Right. If I pick some point P and I calculate the moment of S with respect to P of this set, right, we can do that. We talked about how to do that. It's the sum of the uh, vectors uh, PI crossed with um, and that's to each point crossed with the, uh, the force, Fi. We can calculate that moment. <clears throat> well, it turns out that if I take this point P and I say there's a bounded vector now applied to point P, um, there is a torque of a couple that can uh, be applied to any point. It's the same value for any point. Um, that's from the definition of this torque of a couple. Uh, that makes these two things equivalent. And, and for them to be equivalent, right, turns out that the torque will be this moment. And let me just use a And this vector, I'm going to call it V, equals the resultant of S. Okay, so that, the way I said it the first two times was, I don't, it's not quite that, and I was getting confused, but the idea is that given a rigid body, in this case, a bunch of forces applied to it, I can replace all those forces with a simple torque of a couple and a vector at that at this particular point. I could pick any point that I want and calculate this value. So I could uh, pick this point, calculate what m would be to get the torque, and then put the result in at that point. So the value of the torque will change depending on which point you, you pick, because this is going to be, if I pick different points, I get a different moment. Um, but these two are equivalent, OK? That's, that's that. Any questions on that? Chris, sorry. Yeah, so I'm so confused. If you, since they're equivalent, we could go either direction, right? So if you have like a combination of torques and forces in your system, right, you would want to relegate the torques down to forces and then run through to find that bar using what we talked about. Yeah, if you want to go backwards, I have to pick a bunch of points where I want to find what would what would a force look like there to be equivalent? So if I did that, if I picked all a bunch of points, and I could pick as many as I want, I could um, back out what forces there might be. Is there enough information there? Um, yeah, I think there is. What forces, I don't know if it's a unique set, because the, um, I think it's unique going this way, but that way, um, I think you can imagine, if I pick a set of points that I want to know what the forces are, uh, you can imagine different forces creating the same resultant and the, and the same torque value. So I don't think you necessarily get a unique solution going backwards. 
as, as that's my intuition there. Um, but I th think that's right. Okay. But if you picked like one force out of the set or two, maybe you can calculate the rest. But I think there's some uh, some issues with going back because this is sort of a simplified version. From a, this is a complex version going to a simplified version, and then trying to go from simplified to come back to complex uh, might not have all the information. There. Okay. So the nice thing is, is that for every rigid body, we can we can have these two things to talk about the force, the forces, and the moments acting on it. Essentially, the forces acting on it. Okay, that was that. And then the last thing that I talked about, I just wanted to be clear. I was getting in a funk on this too. Sorry. Right, I told you that FR tilde, generalized um, active force, I'll, I'll write down what everything is. I told, we wrote this equation. So I just want to elucidate what each of these are, right? So this is the um, non-holonomic generalized active force, and let's say the rth generalized active force, and that's 1 to p, right? These correspond to the independent g generalized speeds. Um, this is the uh, holonomic rth generalized active force for that same generalized speed. Right? And if I want to convert from one to another, I have this term. And notice this term is from p plus 1 to n. So these, this sum is over the dependent speeds. So that's associated with the, this is called the dependent. Um, it's still an rth. We're going to count o over these to get the sum, to form the rth thing here. Um, but it, we should call that the dependent um, Holonomic, I think, uh, generalized active force. And this, right, this comes from your um, relationship between your UR and US, where this is the um, I'm going to screw up. Uh, yeah, this, this is what I was. So for me not to write something in Greek, between the independent and dependent GCs, G uh, generalized speeds, right? These are the motion constraints. So that those um, coefficients come from. UR equals the sum of ARS US, where S equals P plus 1 to N plus BR. All right? And I think, I mean, I'm, am I saying something a little. So if you have the Rth holonomic. Generalized active force. You can add this term, which is a sum over the dependent speeds, p plus 1 to n, using this ARS. And this FS is the generalized active force associated with that generalized, dependent generalized um, speed. And that'll get you from one to the other. So maybe that was a little clear. Um, 
it's not the details are maybe are not that that important, but the fact is is there's a relationship between the two, and it's tied to this relationship from the generalized beats is the key thing. So I just wanted to uh, say that. Now, any questions then from from last time there? <clears throat> The last thing that we talked about <clears throat> were that we took, did this double pendulum example, if you recall. And <clears throat> when we looked at these particles, we knew they had a mg, t1, t2, right, forces applied to them. But it turned out when we formed these FR for the system, these canceled out. So we could have formed FR with only, only worrying about that particular force. We could have just ignored these, in fact, and we'd get the same result for our FR calculation. And I said that that's central to Kane's approach to forming these equations in motion. There's a lot of forces that you can ignore. Right? If I'm doing, if I, if you go back to dynamics 101, form F equals MA, we have to draw a free body diagram of every single piece and write all of the forces on each piece and then all of the equal and opposite forces on the pieces connected to, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's what these, these forces are. <clears throat> we don't have to do that here. I don't have to draw every single body with every single force on it and, and then solve for those, those forces. Okay? So that's, that's a nice feature. I can not think about any of those. These forces are what we call non-contributing forces. All right? And <clears throat> I'm going to give you sort of three guidelines to know when to not worry about certain forces. And uh, let me just, non-contributing forces, I'm going to start up here to have a little more room. Uh, the first non-contributing force that you can ignore are contact forces. make no contribution to the generalized active forces. Okay? That's FR or FR tilde. <clears throat> An example three dominoes falling on each other here. <clears throat> this contact force here, oh, oh I forgot, um, that I didn't say this completely right. Oh, I mixed up my sentences. Uh, I didn't finish this properly. Contact forces on particles across smooth, right, that implies frictionless surfaces. All right. Have no, contrib no contributions to the GF. <clears throat> so if these two dominoes here have no friction here, then I can ignore the contact force when I calculate FR and FR tilde. I don't have to think about these. I can just not worry about it. Um, so if this is one, two, neglect force between 
want to do. All right. And this thing might have, you know, some general, generalized coordinates, Q1, um, Q2, however you set up your problem or whatever, but I don't have to worry about that force. Now, the re sort of the reason is, is that this, uh, I don't have the, uh, if you recall, FR equals this sum for particles. This sum of uh, the partial velocity, the rth partial velocity of pi, and this is going to be i to v nu particles dotted with ri, the resultant acting on that particle. That dot product is the key thing, right? If I dot two things that are perpendicular, I get zero. And so these forces. Um, are going to end up sort of being dotted away and cancel out in these equations. So that's one. B, the second one, is that uh, any internal um, contact and body all these uh, distance forces between any two points in a rigid body be and an example of that, if we think about this domino also, say I have a domino that's made of these particles tied together with massless stiff strings. Um, I don't need to know the tension in these strings. I can ignore them. So this is talking about any internal contact and body distance forces between any two points. So these particles, I wouldn't have to calculate anything, free body diagrams. I wouldn't have to worry about picking any given particle in there, in there and think about it as free body diagram. And um, that's that, OK? And then there's one more that is um, essentially a special case of A, two that we can ignore. Is that um, pulling without slip, um, we can neglect all um, what am I reading? All contact forces. Between the two bodies. Okay, so that covers um, <clears throat> a lot of things. And uh, for our, for the example we had last time, <clears throat> these uh, tension forces are um, a case of B, 
right? So I have two particles that were on this rod, and I don't have to worry about the tension forces associated with them. And they're equal and opposite to the tension forces that I would draw for a, the free body diagram of the particle. Right. So in any of these cases, we can throw those things out. And they're a consequence of um, the way FR and FR, FR and FR star, or FR, we're not talking about FR star yet, FR is formed. Okay? So you can throw out any, any internal contact forces, any um, you know, joint forces that are keeping two points at the same location. We're just, uh, we get to throw those out. Now, it doesn't mean that you may not want to know what this contact force is. You may. And, and I'm, I'll talk about that in a later lecture, how you can calculate that if you want to know that. Chris? Yes. Um, if it, uh, well, <clears throat> two points in a rigid body is one key thing. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how you could, it's not clear to me how you might have a uh, so nominee layer. Deflection is going to either tell me I don't have a rigid body or some, something else going on there, right? Something's flexible, and then we have a generalized coordinate surge where it's, it's not. Right here, both, if I calculate both of these, these are nonlinear expressions of the angles, right, and gravity. So both of these are nonlinear. They're not equivalent. Um, Right, because they have to balance all three of those forces. T1 is not equal to T2. Uh, is that, I don't know, is that helping at all? Um, we'll, we'll, the example we do a little later today, I think may address some of your thought process there. Okay? So this is powerful. It's really nice not to have to draw, I don't have to draw free body diagrams of every single little thing, and no matter how many bodies and particles I have, um, you can often neglect all the contact forces, all of these internal forces that keep joints together, and just focus on externally applied forces. And um, uh, yeah, maybe put it contrib uh, they're contributing forces. All right. Okay. Last thing about FR is that we just did it for particles, right? FR, right, was the sum from I equals 1 to new particles VR of that i particle dotted with the resultant of all forces on that particle. <clears throat> okay, so if I had 20 particles, I have 20 terms in the sum, etc. There's an equivalent sum for every rigid body that we have. I'll call this uh, J equals 1 to, uh, I don't know, what, forget what Kane may use there, but let's just say, what's a term I haven't used yet? What's a funny Greek letter? Um, near new. What's the Greek letter related to M? Mu. probably what Kane chose. So here, um, mu rigid bodies. And a rigid body, um, we have this idea that I just talked about that I can describe the forces that act on a rigid body as a, tor as a torque of a couple and a resultant. 
Okay. So here I can do the arc partial velocity of a point Q. Note, let me let me add in here so we're explicit about that. Where in is an inertial reference frame. Arth partial velocity of some point Q dotted with that resultant at point uh, Q. QJ, right? Whatever, this Q that's on that rigid body. Plus, put that in parentheses, um, omega, the arth partial velocity of omega, right? We're talking about a rigid body here. Um, how do I want to use that? We're using Q as the particle, um, and we've got the uh, jth rigid body. Let me just call this AJ, right? So reference frame AJ for however many reasons of the rigid body attached to the reference frame, dotted with our, cup, our torque of a couple acting on AJ. Okay, so just to be clear about this, this is any point on the rigid body. It's often going to be the center of mass is an obvious point to usually choose, but it can be any point. And the associated couple, right, with that point. That's the resultant. This is the um, arth angular velocity of the jth rigid body in it. Okay. So now, if you have a, if you have some system that has particles and rigid bodies. You calculate these partials, you figure out your resultant and the couple, the torque of a couple on each rigid body, and the resultant of any forces acting on any given particle. You got FR. That's all of FR. Okay? Now, let's talk about the last piece here for us to get. The equations of motion. Questions? Right. I'm not going to, you can derive it from the particle um, moment equations and everything, and you can read the book if you want to see that. But, uh, but that's the gist of it. No questions? Last thing is this thing called a generalized inertia force. And like I mentioned before, this is uh, if I had a single particle and its acceleration, it's going to be m times a, negative m times a. Right? So we can write this um, for the holonomic case. Fr. And this is Kane's notation, is this FR and FR star. So FR star, for a set of particles, the sum from I equals 1 to nu of the velocity, the partial arth partial velocity of particle PI in N, right, which is our inertial reference frame, dotted with 
ri star. All right, well, it looks exactly the same as fr, except this is the new term. ri star is defined as negative mass of the ith particle times the acceleration of the ith particle. All right, so that's, I think this week we could write it pi and n to be explicit. Negative mass times acceleration. So for particles, that's what we got. And if we dot that acceleration with our partial velocity, we get the contribution of force or torque. Well, for particles, sorry. Or we get the contribution of force related to that generalized speed. There's also a non holonomic version, just like got a non holonomic system. It's going to be the sum from i to nu of all the particles, the partial um, velocity, the rth partial velocity, uh, the rth non non holonomic partial velocity, dotted with. R I star. Okay? And there's an equivalent relationship between these two, which I'll just write. So the same, same relationship, we use our motion constraint coefficients, ASR, to relate the dependent and independent generalized inertia forces in that case. Okay? Questions there? So if you imagine for a particle only system, fr plus fr star equals um, that first portion, we're going to have the sum from i equals 1 to nu of vr of the i particle dotted with ri, the resultant on that particle of all not all contributing forces, right? All contributing forces plus a vr dotted with And then Newton's law says that those two have to be, some of those has to be zero. Okay, that um, the acceleration of a particle of mass m is proportional to the force. And here we have it written in terms of generalized forces that are associated with these generalized speeds. So that's a key, di key difference. We've explicitly expressed these in these scalar equations that in scalar equations for a holonomic system, <clears throat> that are associated with how the accelerations and the forces acting on the system make a specific generalized speed change. All right, and the last bit here is that <coughs> um, there's also equivalent for rigid bodies. 
and <clears throat> I'll just write the second term there. Dot 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 plus this where this is the particle part. plus the sum from I zero to mu, mu rigid bodies. We'll have the rth partial angular velocity dotted with something called T star. And that's of, um, what term? I used uh, A over there. Sorry, J for here. A, J and in, right, the T star term on that body, A, put an A there, plus um, the partial, the rth partial velocity of B O in in dotted with the resultant r star and this is the um, sorry a a o j right there all right where what are all these terms <clears throat> Rth partial angular velocity of body Aj, the eighth, you know, whatever body that is, and then This is the, um, let me do this one first, rth partial velocity of mass center AO of j rigid body AJ. Okay, so mass center and uh, velocity of the mass center of that body and the angular velocity of that body. Okay, so now what are these two terms? The um, start with R star and uh, I'll, I'll do it right here. Enough room. Um, this resultant R star is going to be the um, negative mass of the jth rigid body times um, the acceleration of the jth mass center and in. Okay, so that's equivalent to sort of the particle. And then this T star there's an equivalent um, for the it captures right this is um, the deri time derivative of the linear momentum here, the ne negative time derivative of the linear momentum. There's an equivalent term for the negative time derivative of the angular momentum, right? So what does this look like? It's going to look like the negative alpha of the aj and n dotted with i of 
This is the inertia dyadic of A about um, A O J. It's central inertia dyadic. This may look familiar, right? Alpha I. And for planar rotation, which may have been all that you saw in dynamics 101, that's basically what you get, alpha times the inertia. But for three-dimensional rotation, there is, uh, there's some extra terms. And that can be written as omega of aj in n crossed with the inertia dyadic of aj with respect to aoj dotted with omega aj in n. All right. Sorry to crowd this. Everybody got this over here? I'll just raise it so it. I guess I shouldn't erase that, but. So this term, when you have three-dimensional rotation, has to be computed, too. And it's uh, associated with taking the time derivative of the angular momentum vector. And in three-dimensional space, you get this, this term. And this is written nicely, compactly, in terms of inertia dyadics and vectors. If you recall, I, if I dot a vector with inertia dyadic, I get a vector. And here, I get a vector, and then I cross it, vector and vector, and I get a, another vector. This term goes away if it's planar, planar motion. Um, if you just have rotation of a body on a surface. All right, so I think that's all I want to say there. This is the magic spot that we've been working towards. <clears throat> fr plus fr star equals 0 for r equals 1 to n for a holonomic system. Let's just highlight that. That is Keynes' equations for holonomic and non-holonomic systems. Right? And this is equivalent to Newton's second law of motion. And Euler's exactly what they call that. Um, Euler is credited to coming up with the rigid body equivalent. So we'll call, I'll just call it, I forget, I forget exactly what, what they call it. All right. And this is sum of the forces equals F equals MA. And this is the sum of the torques. And let me just write them equivalently. DP dt, time derivative of the angular momentum, sum of the torques equals the time derivative of the uh, linear momentum and angular momentum. All right? These two equations are the same as that, 
except that <coughs> we've s done this systematic formulation of them in terms of the generalized speeds with respect to the generalized speeds. And there are a lot of interest. There's a, you know some interesting features of that. One was this thing where the no the non-contributing forces drop out. You don't have to think about them. But if you were to form these more explicitly, and you have done most of you should have done that in Dynamics 101. Um, you don't get to ignore all of the interacting forces between bodies when you formulate those. And, and to do this, use that set of equations for a complex rigid body, you're going to get a big mess, way bigger than the me messes of equations that you've already seen the way we've been doing it. Um, so that's one, one thing, These, those drop out. The other thing is that um, it may not be obvious here, but when we program something, um, this is a very systematic approach, okay? <clears throat> These sums over the rth number of things, um, or two loops really, right? I can think about every particle of interest and every body of interest, and then all the generalized and then all the generalized speeds. So I can loop. I could sort of imagine looping through the particles and looping through the bodies, grabbing in a second loop through each for, uh, VR with respect, respect to each uh, UR. And <clears throat> if I just sort of have a list of the right velocities and the right um, uh, velocities and angular velocities and then these resultants, and then on that side, the accelerations and the angular accelerations. You could imagine, um, maybe you can imagine, and, and maybe we'll see it, but uh, you can package this in a very uh, uh, systematic formulation. And you'll always get this exact same form. Um, if, you, if you do this way, you're not guaranteed to get sort of uh, an equivalent form. But here, we always get these set of equations associated with the generalized speeds that we chose. And, um, and so it's, it's a very systematic, um, relatively easily um, programmable version of forming these laws of motion. Right? So you'll see when we get to forming the equations with uh, SymPy mechanics is that um, we're going to do it manually, just like I've, I've shown these equations. Uh, but because it's so, it lends itself so easy to um, the systematic nature of forming these, uh, we have a, a very nice convenience function that you'll like that will do all of these things. You, like I, I forget f how to calculate fr and rfr star because I never do it anymore. Um, once you program it once, you don't have to do it. You don't have to think about it anymore if you make it generic enough. And I'll show, we'll show you how that, that happens. Okay, any questions here? This is, um, you know, for any given system with um, configuration constraints and uh, motion constraints, you guys should be able to calculate F equals MA. And, and re remind, recall that this is a set of second order Actually, the way the way these are written, I'm gonna I don't want to say that wrong. Um, these come out as a set of first order differential equations. These are called to the dynamical
dynamical equations of motion. In a number of lectures back, we also formed the kinematic or kinematical equations. I call them the kinematical differential equations. And those um, were what related the u's to the q dots. u r for a holonomic, uh, or u r equals the sum of y uh, r s, s equals 1 to n, I believe, q dot r plus z r these are a set of first order differential equations so th this is another key thing in this formulation These, right, there's a derivative um, of position squared here. That's a second order ordinary, uh, second order difference equation, second order difference equation. By default, I get two sets of first order difference equations. Okay? And there's n of these n equations. And here we have n of these, or if it's non holonomic, only p of those. So this is another nice feature. By default, I get my equations in first order form by default. Because we defined these a while back, used that definition in the formulation of these, and so these are only first order. All right, let's Let's take a five minute break and then, let's, and then we're going to do a problem. Uh, we may not get through the whole problem today, so, but we'll see what we can do. So, what I'm going to do, we got everybody back? No, we're still missing. Come on. Another thing that I alluded to, I think, too, is that uh, the kinematics are the hard part. And if you may have noticed, uh, getting all the partial velocities correct is critical to calculating FR and R star. And, and usually that's where you spend most of your time. The second part is you've got to get all the resultant forces and the torque, torques correct uh, in the FR portion. And There's a lot of forces and torques that are easy to deal with, that you can that, that are that are more common. Uh, but if but if you have complex forces, uh, interactions between two bodies or something with complex descriptions of friction or or impact or deformation, lots of things that like can um, forces can get quite complicated too. Uh, so depending on what thing you are studying, that uh, may get um, out of hand. But for a lot of cases, you can use simpler forces, but the kinematics are often complicated. So I want to do a problem here that takes us, hopefully, through every sort of piece of the puzzle, and, and then we get F equals MA. And I... not. Prepared on this, so let's see, new section, uh, MA 223, new section. Um, I forget what lecture this is. Can't, can't use a question mark in my lecture. i just name it section one. And um, OK. 
So let's define this problem. Um, Here I've got a wall and a rod that uh, comes off the wall. On that rod, I'm going to have a block that can slide a along the rod. Okay? And this block has, uh, I'll call it a mass A. I'll label a couple points. That's going to be point O. And this point I'll call P A. And I'm, I'm going to use P A B because I'm going to, I'm going to attach something to it. But uh, this block here is attached to the wall via a spring with a linear um, spring constant K and a damper or dash pot with a linear coefficient c, right? So this, um, the force this generates is proportional to the velocity it sees, or the change in velocity, and the, and the other one's proportional to the um, uh, di change in distance. We're going to say the equilibrium point, if I let this thing go and let it vibrate, it'll come back to zero. So this is now in a stretched position, and there's no free length of the spring. Essentially, we're starting from the free length of the spring. From that, here, we'll say there's a pin joint at uh, MA, or I mean at PA, and we've got a rigid body. And this is all going to be planar. We've got a rigid body here that I call... Um, B, rigid body B, and this is a what you would, a compound pendulum. Uh, any rigid body that you sort of swing from a point, compound pendulum, and it has a. Uh, I'm going to define another point down here that I'll call P uh, B C, and if I draw a line between these two points. There's a point here that I'll call uh, B, B0, B0, or uh, BO, the mass center. And the distance from here to here, I should use some other colors for my. Uh, the distance from here to here is going to be L, fixed distance. And. Um, and then the distance from here to here will be L, two-thirds L, to the mass center. So the mass center is not in between these two points. It has to be right here. And this uh, body has um, a uh, mass B and inertia um, about the, uh, with respect to its mass center, I'll call it. Inertia, that's just an inertia scalar. And we'll, we'll do more with that in a minute, but. Okay, so we got that. And then, um, we'll say that the inertia of this compound peel pinion was pretty large. And from it is hanging a, um, Oops. There's another pin joint here at PBC that has a mass MC here at point C. And this thing we'll call the rod to be assumed to be massless. The uh, whatever structure is there is significantly less inertia than what this thing has, so we'll just ignore it, okay? So I've got a rigid body, a particle here. I've got a particle here with this block. Um, 
the block doesn't rotate, so I'm going to treat it as a particle. And there's one more piece. Uh, between the compound pendulum and this massless rod, um, there's a torsional spring with spring constant k t. Right. So this thing will, can, you know, do, you can move back and forth at the top, sliding. So this is this is basically a uh, double pendulum on a cart, right? And you may have seen uh, some of these. I'll show maybe I'll show a video after we get the equations in motion of some neat neat stuff with these kind of things. But it has a couple other features. It's got uh, this assumption about it being a rigid body B, and then this massless rod. It connects BC to PC, uh, PBC to PC, and then it's got these springs and dash pots that are going to make apply forces to the system. Any questions on on that? A definition of that? Okay. So, the first step here, I think, is we should think about. Um, Generalized coordinates, motion constraints, etc. How many generalized coordinates will we we'll need to describe this system? Three. Uh, the lateral motion of the cart, the angle of the pendulum, the uh, compound pendulum with respect to. Um, the inertial reference, I guess, or the, or the block, and then the angle between the, other, the two pendulums. So we're going to need three. Um, I'll call this one Q1 that locates the, the block or the particle. We'll call this one here Q2, and we'll call um, then the second angle, and I'm going to draw it like this to be explicit all the way. Oops, that's not exactly what I want to. I'm going to draw it from um, here to here as Q3. Ah. All right, three generalized coordinates. Does this thing have any motion constraints? Any thoughts? Uh, no, we'll we'll assume that it can pass through the wall to, to keep things easy. So planar motion. motion. No motion constraints. All right, this is a holonomic system. Um, we'll have three generalized speeds and three generalized coordinates. So. Let's note those down. Um, we got these three generalized speeds, Q1, Q2, Q3, n equals 3. Um, we'll have three generalized, um, sp sorry, those are supposed to be generalized coordinates. So we'll have gen three generalized speeds. We'll call them U1, U1, 2, and U3. And uh, P is also going to be 3, the number of degrees of freedom. Okay, and um, let's name some reference frames here. I'll use uh, green. We'll attach a reference frame in Y in X to define reference frame in and its coordinate system. 
and then I will um, attach the coordinate system here of BX, BY to reference frame uh, to body B. And I'm going to introduce an auxiliary reference frame here also. Um, C, CX, CY, to a reference frame C. It's, a ta it's aligned, stays oriented with that uh, line that connects P PC to PC. So a few other uh, bookkeeping things. How many particles do we have as defined? And what are they? I said the block is a particle. PAB, since it doesn't rotate. What's, are there any more particles? PC, I explicitly just called it a particle at the end of this bottom pendulum. Any others? No others. We'll treat um, the body B as a is our single rigid body that will make up all of the things that have mass and inertia. So we have a rigid body B, right, and it, and it contains um, center mass BO, mass MB, and um, inertia scalar about the z-axis IBO. And the, um, we'll assume that another assumption, I guess, that I should say, uh, oh, I don't know if I need to say that yet. Oh. All right, so that, that's our system. Three part, two particles, one rigid body. Um, and the next thing is to, uh, and we said it's holonomic. I'll just write that here. Holonomic system, um, let's list two, I'll call them, what are all the loads, forces, or torques that we, that we're probably going to have to take, take, it, take, it, take into account. Thinking specifically about what are contributing and non-contributing forces. got one definition that'll clue you in. We're going to be in a gravity, uniform gravity field here. So what do we got to think about? What kind of forces and or torques will we see? Weight. Weight. Okay. So weight of what? Body B. What else? Particle C. Particle C. What about particle A? Horizontal. Yeah, it's horizontal. Um, we'll get to uh, not have to worry about the weight of it. It's supported, and there's a contact force that will cancel out in the formation of FR associated with that um, normal, uh, the normal force that sort of keeps it on the rod and, the, and gravity pulling it down. So that one would disappear. So we got the weight of those two. What else? Oh, I forgot two other definitions. <laughs> uh, the other, other we didn't, I didn't finish defining the problem. I wanted to add in 
a new color, I guess, orange. I want to put a a prescribed force on there. So that's like me me pushing on the pushing on the block. And then let's also imagine that there's a um, uh, a motor or something that can generate a torque between the block and the body. Oh, I forgot to add those. <laughs> All right. So that's essentially we can uh, apply a force to that block to make it do something, and apply a torque to the pin to the compound pinion to make it do something. All right. And those are uh, unspecified uh, things in time. You know, so they change. They might change in time. They might be constant. They might be anything that we might want. We'll just keep them as generic forces and torques that we can apply. So, with that. I'll write those two in there, T and F, call them specified forces and torques. What else that are contributing forces? There's some more there. Bring a damper on the block. So um, the uh, uh, maybe I'll say that translational spring and damper will create some forces, and um, and we got one more spring, rotational spring. Anything else? I think that's it. So those, this is all the pieces of uh, the main pieces here. The next thing that's useful, I think, is to let's write out what FR and FR star should look like. And I think that'll give us an idea of all the things that we're going to have to calculate to formulate those. So. I'm going to do it below this so I can leave this on the screen. Starting with FR, the first term is the sum of a couple of the particles, right? So we have the partial velocities dotted with the resultant on the particles. So we have two particles, and um, that means that we'll have V, the first partial velocity dotted with the resultant, and I'll put uh, particle AB first, and this is going to be the velocity of AB and N, plus the second partial velocity of PAB and N dot it with the resultant on PAB. So FR, if we get the resultants and the velocity and the partial velocities, we get those portions. <clears throat> That's our two particles. We've got one rigid body, so there's also a term there. Um, and that's going to be the partial uh, I am sorry, those are supposed to be R. We're only supposed to sum over the particles. So the R partial velocity, to get FR, I got, I'm using the R, and they'll be in equations. Sorry about that. Here we're going to have uh, the partial velocity of, I'm going to select. We don't have to, but I'm going to select a B naught center of mass, N in, dotted with R star of um, B naught. Yes, thanks. 
Yeah, because I, that, I, was, I was iterating, summing through the R's instead of the... So this is PC, the second particle. Start with that. So the sum is over the particles. One Particle one, particle two for the R thing. And then we've got one rigid body that has a linear term. And that's not an R star. <laughs> I'm all over the place here. And then a, that's the resultant at B naught plus the rth angular velocity of b in n dotted with any torques on b, the, tor sum, the resultant torque on b. So that is um, fr. Two particles, one rigid body. You'll have... The terms like that for uh, each. So this is uh, PAB, PC, and B. And then FR star and let's remind ourselves R equals 1 to 3 in our case. Here we're going to have for the particles VR, PAB, times, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and write out um, R, um, the uh, resultant R star as a negative MA times acceleration of PAB and N. Plus, same thing for the second particle, dotted with negative mc acceleration of pc and n. Okay, so that's particle ab, particle c, and now we have a term for the rigid body, the single rigid body. And that's made up of um, V, V naught in R, right, the center of mass, dotted with negative MB times the acceleration of P, sorry, P naught in N plus the rotational acceleration term, which is going to be omega, the rth omega of B and N, uh, dotted with, right, this longer term, negative alpha B and N, plus the inertia dyadic, I'm dotted, sorry, dotted with the inertia dyadic associated with B naught, plus omega B and N crossed with the inertia dyadic of B naught, dotted with omega B and N. And that's also for R equals 1 to 3. Three equations there. So we have to calculate all of these terms. In particular, the velocities and accelerations <coughs> of, of the points PA, PB, let me see, PA, B, PC, and B, not. And that will take care of, we can get the par all these partials and we can get these acceleration, linear acceleration values. <coughs> We're also going to have to figure out the um, angular velocity of B and N and its partials, which come into there and there. Angular acceleration of B and N, 
this inertia dyadic. And uh, these resultants, resultant forces acting on there. We've done everything in this so far, previous work. We haven't calculated these resultants yet. So why don't we calculate our PAB, our PC, our B naught, and TB. And then we'll jump into SimPy and do all the do all the other stuff. But let's at least sketch those out. Um, so starting with uh, particle PAB, what contributing forces do we need to worry about on particle PAB? We, we've listed them all, on, all the, under that load section too. damper and the input force or that specified force. We can ignore the mg, right, and the um, force that the compound pendulum is pulling on that block because those are all non-contributing. Non so there's a F. There's two forces pulling it backwards here. Uh, one associated with spring and the damper, mg, and then some tension force from the compound pendulum, which I'll call uh, F, uh, FAB. So these two, we don't need to worry about due to our rules about non-contributing forces. What would be the value, the magnitudes of those two forces I've drawn here? Uh, for the spring and the dash pot damper. So the resultant. A, B is going to be F minus KQ1 minus C, Q1 dot, all in the in X direction. All right. You need a resultant of, at uh, uh, PC. What, what forces are PCC? There's PCC that are contributing. Just gravity. Just gravity. And what direction is that? Negative in Y, always. Okay, so we got the first two term. We got that, and that about R resultant of all forces on B naught. And this ties into the uh, thing I opened with trying to explain the. Resultant, if you, you can describe all of the forces acting on a rigid body um, at a, with a, uh, a vector at a single point combined with a pure torque or torque of a couple. So what would be the, this R resultant here is the that single resultant uh, vector in terms of that. Torque? So this uh, R is is a um, a 
it is a for, it's a resultant force, so it should be a force. The the T bar B, that's a resultant torque on the body. So what would be the only? There's uh, one force that is contributing. It's just gravity in this case too. So this is also negative M B G in the N Y direction. The resultant force, the resultant contributing force acting on that rigid body is only the gravity acting at its center of mass. Last thing is this uh, T. What are the torques acting on B? What are we going to have to think about there? Specified torque and a torque from the torsional spring. Those are going to be the only contributing <laughs> torques there. Um, if we had friction in the joints, you might that could be contributing. Um, but we're going to have to take care of those too. So if I think about that um, rigid body and there's a torque applied to it here, called T, and um, if I draw this like so, we'll say that the, uh, the spring exerts no force when our Q3 is, is equal to zero, to make a simple definition of that. So if this is a torsional spring of some sort that connects those two, and I guess maybe draw maybe drawing a torsional spring like uh, this or something is better. It has a torsional spring constant of kT, then the resultant of all the torques acting on this body. Uh, if I if I think about the body by itself, we have this one up here that's specified torque. And if I push this rod, if I hold this still and push that rod up, then it's going to uh, generate. There has to be equal and opposite torque that resists that. So the, the torque. We want to make sure we get the directions. Um, correct here, but between the torque between this rod and the compound pendulum uh, is going to have to be, let's see, if I, um, going to have to be in this direction, right? And it's going to be KT Q3. So if Q3 is 0, and then if you, if you draw the other piece here, it's an equal and opposite. And they both, both have a magnitude of kT Q3. All right? Or am I drawing those wrong? I feel like I'm drawing those. It should be the opposite direction. If I... Uh, Apply. If I rotate that thing, it's um, yeah. I think I got them opposite. I'm sorry. If I rotate it up, um, there's a torque that wants to push it, push the rod back down, in the equal and opposite in the other direction. That makes sense. Sorry about that. But that always, always get confused. So both of these torques are just defined um, in the positive sense on the, on the body B as uh, pointing out of, of the board. Okay. So be careful in the sense there. 
So this TB then is going to be a positive T plus KT Q3. If Q3 is positive, we get a positive torque acting on the um, on that pendulum, and then we've defined the sense of T. All right. So now, what do we got left? We got um, only five minutes, right? I told you, Chris, last time we would do Simpy, but we didn't. So now you can call me a, a fibber, I guess. So what, what we'll do next time is um, we'll calculate all the velocities and accelerations, and we'll and we'll move over into Simpy. And we're going to form at, we'll form F R equals F R star. And then I'm going to show you the easy way to do it uh, using the convenience functions that we have in Simpy mechanics. And we'll simulate this system also um, Monday. So I'll show you how to do basic simulation. And um, uh, if I can get it, uh, I should have time to speak. And hopefully I'll, ha I'll show you how to visualize it too, make a little animation. And that's sort of, that's like a, um, that'll be a pretty big picture thing there. We, you get the symbolic equations of motion. We'll then uh, jump over to numerics land and do numerical integration to um, solve these first order differential equations with respect to time. And then see what, you know, the nonlinear uh, motion of the of this system is and what we might can learn from it um, with simulation tools. So if you have a, a, well, we'll need to, and then we'll talk about some other things. Maybe we can use the last five minutes. What um, <clears throat> topics might you all be interested in? And maybe it's, you know, I, I know what everybody's projects are, and I could think about things that are rel relative, but uh, some of the things are, um, this, uh, some of the things are um, how this compares to other um, ways to formulate equations of motion. And there it turns out there's a lot and a lot of interesting advantages and disadvantages of different approaches. Um, we could um, talk uh, specifically about um, the numerical aspects of integration and um, and what to do when you have like very stiff systems and uh, what are different kinds of in numerical integrator routines and, and, and why, when they're useful and not, not useful. Um, oh yeah, another thing I'm definitely going to talk about is we don't have to think about these non-contributing forces, but sometimes you want to know what it is. Right? Maybe I want to know how much force is being put on the block by this thing when it's swinging around because the block's not that strong and it might break. Well, we'll do that. Um, there's things, coll collision, right? If you want to know how to define the forces associated with bodies colliding, um, that's a good topic. Uh, we could also talk about um, energy and things. That's not too big of a topic, but uh, we can do that. And then there was one more thing I was thinking of. The oh, we've only done simple rotations so far. There, there are all also are a lot of more complex rotations where you can orient a body um, using uh, in three dimensions in one shot with a set of three to four variables. And um, I, I, somebody on their exam used the body fixed rotation option in uh, SimPy. So somebody's already figured it out. But you can ro rotate. If I have uh, three simple rotations, I can, I can do them with a different types of uh, 
rotations. Uh, you may have heard of Euler angles, probably is, is one. Um, there's, a, there's a number of other sets of rotations. So any thoughts on that? Like what, uh, what, what's, what's most interesting? Anybody want to call out any of those? Or should, it, or should I make a poll or something? No thoughts? All right, I'll, I'll write them down and post them. Maybe, a, maybe I'll make a little poll like the homeworks and Piazza and you guys can think about them if you want. And I'll try to tailor the last three weeks to, the, to those topics that would be most useful to you. Okay, so I think it will probably be the last two weeks. We'll have, we'll have one week of simulating and non-contributing forces. I think those are the two, simulation, visualization, non-contributing forces are the two key things that I, I definitely want to make to go over. And then we have four more lectures that I can do, um, things that, are, that you all want to see. Okay? All right. Let's shut it down.